My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I am the CEO of After the Fire. Welcome to the podcast, How to Disaster, Recover, Rebuild, and Reimagine. In this podcast, we bring you the very best practices, best hearts, and great ideas from other disaster-affected communities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome once again to the How to Disaster podcast, where we help you recover, rebuild, and reimagine. My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I'm the CEO of After the Fire. Today, we have a very exciting guest, and I know I always say that, but that's what I always think, too. Uh, Jolie Wills is here, and she is from Hummingly, which is a, an organization she co-founded with her partner. She's going to tell us all about that. Uh, you know, of note, which is very exciting, is that I had the opportunity last week to be with Jolie and really see her work firsthand when we were in the Marshall Fire with a delegation in Boulder, Colorado. You know, one of the very big gaps in disaster recovery is how do you take care of the helpers. You know, we've talked to Susan Farron of First Responders Resiliency on this podcast, and we've talked to the amazing and much beloved Dr. Adrian Hines about these issues as well. The thing that Jolie brings to this work, which I just absolutely love, is these tools that I have not seen before. And these tools are like cards for catastrophe. And this this workshop that she took us all through last week that really did, resonated so much. I know with me after six years in this field, and then people who've been doing this who are emergent leaders who've been around this work for about a year and a half, but certainly feel the weight of it and do need that sort of um, ability to to talk about what are the challenges, what are the pitfalls, how is this difficult, and how is it hopeful at the same time? You know, a thing that we all go through in disaster, and myself included, is that once it happens, it feels so large, that it's very hard to say to your spouse, you know, can you not just step aside for the next one to 10 years of my life while I help my community rebuild? And that's something that uh, somebody that we really love, um, a, a a leader on the ground in Boulder pointed out is that she had told her husband kind of sit on a shelf for right now. And that was, you know, that's really not a good thing for us to do to ourselves or our partners. I have to note that it really resonated with me because that's exactly what I said to my husband as well, both, you know, overtly and covertly by how much I dove straight into this work and didn't really come up for air for probably two years. And that was not necessarily the best uh, at all and not recommending that, um, you know, strategy. And so one of the things we like to do here is absolutely admit the ways in which we maybe went wrong and to talk about some of the best practices. So, um, you know, I'm actually really looking forward to having Jolie uh, along with um, After the Fire and the work that I do in both private consulting and the nonprofit, you know, to really help community leaders provide and find personal sustainability. I know people say that all the time and it's an overused word, but it's just something that's so, so important. And the thing about disasters, it sort of levels all of your expectations of how the world will be and who you are in it, what your role is, what you can do. And it's really difficult if you know that you have something to offer to alleviate suffering, to be able to step back and say, I also cannot create this whole ecosystem of private suffering in my own world and in my own family. Uh, jo Lee is very impressive. She's from New Zealand. She is a survivor of the Christchurch earthquake, which was in 2010, with several um, aftershocks, the worst and most devastating one in 2011. Side note, when we did not know how to disaster, one of the places that I turned to to read all of their surveys was the Christchurch. I really wanted to know, how did you do this? And I love the fact that they actually surveyed their people every single year. They did a wellness survey. They wanted to know, how are they doing? You know, what are the gaps? What can we do? It's one of the things that I wanted so much for us here in Sonoma County, where I live. You know, but it just was not something quite... Um, it was something we were used to in domestic disasters here in America. We know we do them in other countries. We did not do Christchurch. They did theirs. Uh, but they're standard elsewhere, but they're just not standard here. And I really wish that they were. So I've invited Jolie on here today to talk to you about her background, which is very cool. She's a cognitive scientist, how she came to do this work. And, you know, how did she distill all of these important lessons from over 100 global leaders in disaster into this very 
cool interactive workshop format. So uh, once again, welcome to the How Disaster podcast, and we're so happy to have uh, Jolie Wills from Hummingly on today. Thank you. Uh, once again, welcome Jolie to the podcast. Thanks very much, Jennifer, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. You know, I told the audience in your intro that I was super excited because it was so great to actually see you in action uh, last week. And I told I want to talk about that. The way I want to open today is for you to talk to us about Hummingly. What is it? And uh, and we will obviously have links where people can find you. But tell us about your company. Yeah. So co-founded by Elizabeth McNaughton and myself. So there's two of us that that started basically out of the need for designing some of the resources that we saw were really needed after all the disasters that we'd worked in. So between the two of us, you know, we've supported communities um, more than three decades through like all sorts of disasters around the globe, including one that I lived through myself and experienced firsthand. But we just kept seeing these similar challenges playing out. You know, every community is different, right? And, you know, every group of people working in that is different and every disaster is different. But in amongst that, there were these common challenges that people were struggling with, whether it's recovery leaders, whether it's um, people supporting communities or the community members themselves, you know, coming up against the same kind of challenges. So for us, it was around, let's learn from other disasters, collate all of that learning into resources that will help those various different groups to make it just that little bit easier, you know, that disaster recovery or supporting communities, because, you know, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard run for anyone involved, you know, in disasters. It's a very hard run. And that's, you know, this is like why we started the podcast. One of the things that you and I really enjoyed, I think, was that we are very aligned. Yes. Um, but I really like the fact that you have all this depth in this other area that I also really care about. But I'm more of a generalist for community recovery. And so you've really uh, you've really been so um, intentional about how you dive into this particular really there's four areas so do you want to do you want to cover those four areas and then I want to talk about your own personal story yeah sure so the four areas again these are the design challenges that we would just see these challenges playing again and again and we're like well, what if we could help with that by connecting people with the learning from others who have been through it so that it's not as hard and the first one was you know when you are impacted by a disaster you often don't have a sense of what's ahead or how to navigate your way through it you know and it's communities that will drive that recovery but they often don't have access to you know recovery knowledge the knowledge from others who have been through something similar which is why we love after the fire obviously you know and all the work that you're doing and so for us it's like how do we pull together all of those learnings and lessons from recovery experts who have seen it again and again and from other communities who have lived it so we created you know cards for calamity which is a resource that will really help guide communities through what comes after you know when all the sirens and lights have disappeared and they're left with the thousands of, thousands of decisions and thousands of challenges and so that was the first area the second one was you know there's a part of the gritty slog process that is so difficult for communities was interacting with all of these systems and agencies and processes that they never imagined that they would have to interact with you know that often these systems often aren't designed for the reality that people see after disaster and the frustration and the hurt and the anger and the exhaustion that all of these systems and processes often cause and we call that you know secondary stress you know, the, the disaster after the disaster is mm -hmm. often how it's put. And so for us, you know, people working in those agencies don't set out to frustrate people who are just, you know, or to cause they're very harm in nice any people. way. Right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're great people um, trying to do good things um, without, again, the training, the knowledge, the expertise around how to work well with disaster affected people, how do we design those systems and processes to really help recovery rather than inadvertently hinder. So that was our, our second one. So we worked with agencies on that. Um, the third one was, and we'll talk a little bit about our own experience, but in our own disaster, we felt the weight of a leadership role, you know, of and supporting a community through recovery. 
And we realize we're not the first, this isn't the first disaster the world's ever had, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not the first people to have a leadership role after disaster. So to do this the best way we can, we should be drawing on the learnings from others, avoiding some of those pitfalls, you know, really helping um, steer ourselves through this in the best way we could. And we found it really difficult to find the advice that we needed. So we, we interviewed more than 100 crisis leaders, recovery leaders after disaster and asked them, what, did you, what do you really wish that you'd known? Mm -hmm. And packaged all of that up to guide leaders. So that was our, our third piece. And the last one that I think you know, we probably will speak more about today is how do we sustain and support the very good people who are really leaning in to support communities after disaster, often impacted themselves, not always, yep. but have a support role in recovery. Um, and it's, it's usually a role that's it's not about the lights and sirens. It's not, you know, it lasts way beyond the, you know, the sexy stage where there's a whole lot of yeah. <laughs> media and attention and then everyone moves on to the next yeah. event or to the next thing that's going on in their lives and um, the long haul recovery piece those that are helping to support that on the ground how, how do we help prevent some of the bad things that we were seeing happening in terms of burnout and turnover for those people and I'm so glad that you called it the slog because that's what we call it too and it's it's um it can be very disconcerting and also uh, re-traumatizing there are certain things that re-traumatize the community and one of them is in that slog they look around and uh you know now they're ready now they're like okay all right we got through that you know sexy super traumatizing stage and some people might be like how is that sexy but when you get a long way out of it you do see like how that was your adrenaline is flowing and the love is in the air and everyone's like together and you know their their community and the honeymoon period and then you enter into the true reality of what recovery takes yes. and de depending on the size and place of your disaster and your size of your donations and, and your land values and insurance rates and there's all of these things that come into it yeah. and then you have to navigate those as you said and it's just um it's incredibly tough and there aren't a lot of tools to do that. And it's, you know, one of the reasons why we started helping other communities because we're like, that was terrible. Maybe yes. we can make it less terrible for you. Yeah. Um, but I would like to just sort of um, step back for a moment because I'm always interested in people and their stories. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about your own story. Yeah, sure. And and my story is kind of interwoven with my co-founder. So if I give her just a little bit of her background first. Um, so Elizabeth had worked in disasters all over the globe. This was kind of her career, what it is that she did, looking at the long-term recovery. She started with the, um, and I have to think about what it's called here, because in New Zealand, we call it the Boxing Day Tsunami. So it's a, mm -hmm. um, the I know, I know Boxing Days. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Boxing Day yeah. is the day after Christmas. We love That's it. Fun. We wish we had it everywhere. It's a very good holiday. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Indian Ocean tsunami, you know, that impacted yeah. Thailand, Sri Lanka, you know, like really, and other areas, really huge, huge scale event. And this is sort of where Elizabeth cut her teeth, you know, in the disaster space. She'd worked in these large scale disasters around the globe. Um, her story is that she came back to New Zealand to recharge her batteries, <laughs> to start a family, go for some bushwalks, as we'd call it, go hiking. Um, and of course, the Christchurch earthquake happened. So that's running in parallel. So she ended up stepping in and supporting with that. That's how we met. We met working on this um, earthquake. For me, my background is I'm a cognitive scientist. So I'm really interested in the connection between stress and our cognitive abilities and our performance, our decision making, our ability to take on information to, you know, all those things that we know there's a fair bit of stress flows after disaster, right? So, um, but my background was in community services, you know, working with um, people with disabilities, mental health sector, older person sector. And then the Christchurch earthquakes happened, you know, and um, so for me, that's my home city. And... Just to give you a, a little bit of a sense, it all started for us very, very early one morning in September in 2010. Um, we were very close to the epicenter, which was just outside Christchurch, um, a magnitude more than seven on the Richter scale. So a really huge, very shallow event. Um, and I kind of grew up with earthquakes. So, you know, it's kind of like a good thunderstorm. So I thought this is yep. kind of exciting, but it went from that switch flipped very, very quickly to this is something very different and that that real terror of will we survive this kind of moment. Um, and, you know, we had two small kids 
And it all started from there, really, you know, both of us heading to our kids, sheltering in place, surviving, fortunately, the first earthquake, um, and then looking around and going, oh, what do we do now? Right. You know, we, we all trained around the first, you know, 48, 72 hours. So we knew that, you know, we, we could work it out with our water and our food and supporting each other as neighbors. But beyond that, it was what, what happens next, you know, not having a sense of, you know, what, what does it mean when you have a city of 400,000 people where 95% of the homes were damaged or destroyed, right? That's and we nice. had 15,000 aftershocks. And it was actually one of those aftershocks that hit in February 2011 that claimed the lives of 185 people, um, you know, and injured thousands. And our central business district was roped off for two or three years, could not be accessed. And you've got all of the horizontal infrastructure that needed to be repaired before you could even get to the building. And so like every community after a disaster or, or people working to support a community, there was this naive sense of what it would take, mm -hmm. of how long it would take. You know, and you start off in this adrenaline-fueled way with your task list and just, you know, I'll put everything else on hold and I'll just focus on this. And then, it, you know, all your energy goes there and then realizing, you know, what we thought was days, weeks or months turns into years. And it was a really long process. So it was in that context that I end up um, leading some of the psychosocial recovery work in Christchurch. So support to the bereaved, the seriously injured, um, the wider support to the population around the, the stressors and the of you know the ongoing aftershocks, but the insurance and the rebuild processes. So there was a lot of you know how do we support a community through what comes next in the long haul phase. And the bit that got me so interested in supporting and sustaining the supporters was, you know, as a cognitive scientist, I'm like, this is going to be a lot of stress for a long time. And we're going to have to need to protect and support our people through this if they're going to be able to sustain their support to a community. Because most of them, like me, were impacted too. Right. Mm. And so there was that realization early on. And we put everything in place that we could think of, every well-being strategy or approach I could find, resilience training, you name it, we tried it. Right? Mm. And the reality was we were still burning our people out. We were just burning them out slower than others that weren't intentional about trying to support them. <laughs> you know, we were all headed to not a great place. So every table I sat down around, whether it was with government, whether it was, you know, local community leaders, emerging leaders, whether it was, you know, health, um, you know, all sorts of social services, um, the exhaustion and the fatigue just became really, really obvious and prevalent and the impacts that we were starting to see out, see play out personally for people supporting communities, but also for their organizations, for their mission and for the community when they've got all this turnover of people working to support them, impaired decision making, loss of, you know, like all those things were having a, taking a real toll. You know, I, I did hear uh, the story, but I like the story. And um, who doesn't mind listening to a New Zealand accent? Because I know I don't mind. Um, but I think that it it does matter, though. Like all of the, you know, usually like, yeah, I just speak for like two minutes and then we'll all speak. But I am in, I think you just should go, go, go. It's fine. Oh. Keep going. All right. Thank you. And just as an aside, someone told me recently, the New Zealand accent has been described as the most pleasant in the world, but doesn't mean that anyone can understand me. So I have a very good American friend who's, you know, who often says, if only you had subtitles when you spoke. So oh, I'm well, hoping this is translating for people. Yeah. You know, the good news is, is that we transcript everything and people can turn on captions and they'll be fine. Um, but yeah. I find it, I find it rather comforting. So it's, okay. um, I, I think we can just go with it. It's fine. Okay. All good. So anyway, this was the challenge that we were finding, right? You know, the seeing the impacts really sobering when you're seeing these mission driven, amazing people who have put so much energy into supporting communities when this, there's the sense of unrelenting need, right? And so it's so uncomfortable to, and feels almost impossible to prioritize yourself in amongst all of that. So we would keep seeing this gap between, we all know we need to prioritize self-care. We all know we need to look after ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if people would say, if you would tell me one more time that I need to get good exercise, eat good food, get some exercise and get some sleep, yeah. you know, like, I know that, but in the reality and the, in the environment we were working in, all of those things were really, really challenging and difficult. 
And self-care wasn't the only component at play, right? There's a lot yeah. that we need to be doing as leaders and organizations to support our people, not it, just expecting them to, to look after themselves. I found that in, in my case, and I've seen this a lot, is that um, when I wasn't boots on the ground or thinking about the disaster or how to fix it or how to help people, and I was like, well, I have more capacity um, for the, you know, the stress of it or whatever it is, I felt like in times that were quiet, I needed to cocoon mm -hmm. and that the, all the self-care was like, well, you need to get out there and exercise. And it was more like, you need to, you need to, you need to. And I was surrounded by so much need yes. that doing their prior and I still struggle with this but doing that prioritizing the self-care piece when I wanted to cocoon instead which meant also not communicate you know and I really loved it when the when the uh, the leader in um, who I love so much in the Marshall fire uh, when she said you know I told my basically told my husband I'm just going to put you on a, I just put him on a shelf over there and I'm like why would you have needs like I need you just not to not need me like that's the biggest thing that I need I totally related to that and my husband would be over here like nodding like a banshee so <laughs> it's an interesting yeah. it is such an interesting dynamic and to talk to somebody who's so um versed in it and has seen it so often yes. so I just wanted yeah. to side note that it's yeah. very common yeah yeah very very common and very real and I think you know we are driven because of our biology with that adrenaline to be very task oriented mm -hmm. and those tasks just don't go away <laughs> that to-do list just doesn't seem to get shorter not for a very very long time yeah. and so this need to put all our energy and focus on these tasks um, means that what happens is we tend to really detract from or neglect the things that we do to nurture our relationships or you know to look after our physical health basics or to just do things in life that give you energy joy you know that just bring light and um, color to your life and when we put all of those things on hold for a really prolonged period which is what this always is mm -hmm. that's when we start to see people becoming so disoriented they can't you know they've forgotten who they are and, and how to be in the world like you know that's extreme disorientation when you know you're, you're disconnected from from many of the things that are really important in your life the impacts on relationships you know honestly the the incredible impacts on people's physical health and oh. and on their mental health and just you know really huge and the sad thing is you know so maybe one step back as a result of seeing all this playing out um I ended up doing a Winston Churchill fellowship so I was really lucky to to be part funded to travel around the globe speaking to others who'd been through something similar after disaster and one learn whether these we were alone in these impacts and of course we weren't they were very common exactly as you were saying and what are the things we need to do better and differently you know as um, leaders as funders as organizations supporting people working in this space but also as people with a role in it ourselves and the number one bit of advice that we kept hearing over and over again from people who'd had a role and had come out the other end was you know everyone kept telling me to look after myself they said it was really, really important and it just felt really impossible to do. But if I would go back and give myself a piece of advice, it would always be that, mm -hmm. you know, because you would have avoided X, Y, and Z as a result of some of these, these impacts. Um, so yeah, that, that was very much the backstory to us working out, well, how do we bridge the gap mm -hmm. between the fact we know we need to look after ourselves, but we find it really difficult to do. And some of the things that we know are really important for our well-being, but the behavior that plays out when we are really dedicated to a mission for a prolonged period of time drives us in the opposite direction um, and how do we help leaders and agencies understand what they need to do to support people in this space and I think if people haven't been you know um, one of the reasons why I prefer to work with people who've been through a disaster um, because I don't really know how to I've tried teaching it to people who haven't um, and it's not that they don't care. They're not wonderful people, but it just doesn't resonate the same. Mm -hmm. It isn't that visceral sort of, um, uh, it's like a deconstructing of what you thought was predictable or real. And then if you like, I, you know, Christchurch was your home city. So seeing that destroyed um, on a totally different, you know, level, but I, I, I do feel in, the I do feel informed by driving away from Sonoma in the middle of an evacuation and a long line of people and having my dogs in the back and um, I have this I took a selfie which sounds terrible I didn't take a lot during but I was like because I looked like hell and I was like 
I don't think I like these natural disasters. They are not for me. You know, I have no idea how my life would change, but it's so horrible to Mm -hmm. see everyone that you love and all of your markers of who you are. Like that was my thought because I knew working for the county that Sonoma downtown was 10 minutes away from burning down. Right. And I grew up there. My husband grew up there and I was just like, I don't even know who I'll be. Like if I don't see on that corner, all the markers of my life, of my maturity, everything you sort of owe the place, the home, it's not the house, but the home that sort of like raised you and brought you and who you are and who you carry through the world. And it is a, it's a, it's a, just a very surreal and um, grief stricken experience. And we were fortunate that it didn't. And so I, it is different in that sense that yours actually was devastated. And so I want to acknowledge that I see that difference, but um, now I feel fortunate that I had that terrible moment because at least I have a clue. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the hard thing with mental health is that once you've been through a disaster or you see like the absolute leveling of what you thought was true and what you thought was going to happen tomorrow and what you thought you would see is gone. It's all gone and it's never going to look exactly the same. And that's a big thing we tell communities when we go in and they're like, oh no, we want it exactly back like it was. And we're like, so sorry. Um, It doesn't, it's gone. Like that's the day before and now this is the day after, but maybe we can help walk you through. So you're, I love the fact of how trauma informed you are. I mean, of course you are, but a lot of people think that they are, but you also did this really cool thing with your trauma informed knowledge, which is you, you didn't just stay stuck in where you were. You actually pivoted your model of sort of delivery in a way that people could actually Um, that you can meet them where they're at. Can you talk about that? Because I have one of your things here. I'm not selling because I'm not allowed to do that. I do run a nonprofit, but um, the thing is is that I've actually seen this in action and you were so kind to do this um, for the Marshall Fire community. So if you can talk about these cards and cards for calamity because our workshop in a box, like I really love, love that you did this. Yeah. And, And for me, it's the cognitive science piece, right? So again, we did all of this research Um, around how do we support people working in this environment? How do we sustain them? We did all this research around how do we support leaders? Like, what do they need to know? Um, And what we would see in terms of what was out there were things that were inaccessible. When you've got a tired brain or a full brain, or you just got so much to do in in the sense of the pressure that you're facing, the overwhelming need. So that was very much our challenge, right? As, okay, What's the point of having this knowledge that you can't access and use in the pressured environments you're in? So we'd see 700 page guidance documents for leaders after disaster. I mean, you know, like having been there myself, no, I'm, I'm trying not to swear, but just no chance, right? Yeah. <laughs> no know, chance. Not enough highlighters, post-its, time. Also, you can't, you just can't take it in. Like we call it fire brain. Yeah. It really it takes a, at least right. a year. Yes. Um, and you can't take it in. They aren't used there. We, I tell this to local governments too, and they ask me to speak to them. I'm like, you should just QR code that and yeah. see if it can change. But you're not, it's, 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 I know they have to do it. I get that, but it's not, it's not as accessible as what you've done. No. And so it's just knowing, I mean, I guess that unique perspective of being able to connect in with others who had been in these various different roles and being able to research and connect in with that learning added to that, the personal experience of knowing that there's just no way you could absorb this in this form. And then the third piece being the cognitive science, which is really understands how a brain operates under pressure and, and, you know, cognitive load and what it is we need to do to make things accessible and usable. Um, and that simplicity is hard, right? It was a hard process. It took us many years and, and working with people, but understanding some of the, the processes. So the, the first foray into that was the leadership guide. So it's called um, Leading in Disaster Recovery, a Companion Through the Chaos. And that is a, a guide for leaders that's freely available. Um, it is now located in DC, DC in the um, Global Center for Disaster Preparedness, which is an international federation of Red Cross resource. So that was our first, again, no 700 page document. It's you know 30 page maximum full of just quotes, stories, questions, things that you can absorb and use as a leader. So that was our our first foray into we need to design something that works 
The second one was the cards for calamity. Again, seeing the same things playing out for communities again and again, um, and the need for communities to have access to that recovery knowledge so that they could apply it in a way that made sense for them in their community. But, you know, knowledge is power. And, you know, they're trying to navigate their way through all of these challenges and all of these decisions um, without a sense of, of, you know, what has been done elsewhere, what might be helpful, what might be ahead for me. And so Elizabeth and I were working in, very, in different disasters at this point, and we were messaging, pulling together our research, but also messaging those things that communities, you always see their shoulders come down around their ears, come down <laughs> around their, you know, that sense, oh, that's normal, oh, that's, so, oh, that's yeah. useful, or just, you know, going away with some strategies and ideas and mm -hmm. having things normalized. And so we, we wrote a book, <laughs> Jennifer, we started by writing a book. Oh, I had that was, idea too. And then I was like, who's ever going to read that book? Thank you. Yeah. So we had it in draft phase and I looked at her and I'm, I'm a cognitive scientist. What am I thinking? I've been through disaster. I would never have had time or brain space to read a book. So we deconstructed that into the cards for calamity. So again, that process thinking about how it is that we can absorb information and what it is those key messages people need to really, in terms of recovery knowledge to guide them. And the doing well was the same. You know, again, you know, brought back a lot of this learning around, um, we call it triple responsibility. So the ways in which we can support people after disaster. Um, there's an individual component that self-care stuff's really important and very vital. But we can burn out and, you know, damage the most resilient of people with all the right things in place if we, we load them up with too much for too long. So again, we have workshops in a box to help leaders understand what they can do to support people under pressure, including sustaining themselves, you know, what teams can be doing to be able to support each other, because when we're under immense pressure for a long period of time and we're really tired, um, you know, teams can be, become a source of stress as well, right? But yeah. on the flip side, if we set them up well, they're the most amazing source of support. Mm -hmm. And then at the individual level, it was that design challenge of, well, we know we need to look after ourselves, but it feels impossible to do. And yet everyone's saying, if I could go back, it would be that thing that I would, I would find a way to do. So how do we help people with that? Right. You know, you actually, one of the things you said, which, uh, which really resonated with me, a few things for sure. I mean, you know, I could just go on, but it was that thing about um, that you realized that you were leading your team into the same sort of burnout. And I think that that's a very hard thing for people to um, feel in, in places of leadership. And I've, I thought about that because I have pared down my team dramatically because I was finding it so stressful in that way. And it's then they just, I felt like, okay, well, let's just re let's just restructure how we're doing this so that I can have personal sustainability, but also I can tell them don't, and you know, you don't need to answer emails after 5 PM. Mm -hmm. You don't have to work on a weekend, but if I'm sending emails at 10 PM midnight, you know, what a six and then 6 a.m. the next day, like it doesn't, yeah. what I'm doing is I'm setting a tone at the top for what I value. And Excellent. what I value obviously is um, no personal space and um, burnout. Yeah. And so I, you know, and I, and I got better at that over the years for sure, but not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I got that much better at it because I do, I am on a mission and I'm clear, mm -hmm. about, I'm clear about that. You yeah. can't expect everybody else to be on a mission though. And if you don't, make it so clear or make, give them lots of space to take care of themselves. I probably went overboard on the lots of space and um, backfired a little bit at times, but I thought that that was really profound. And I think the mission piece is hard because we drive ourselves so hard. And again, that seeing that need that is so very real and tangible when you're upfront and close and personal with it in a community it is just so hard as a leader too to prioritize all of that, you know. And um, there's a story I know you heard me tell last week, but one of the very first people we interviewed was a woman who, phenomenal recovery leader, so well respected in her community, has done amazing things, um, very effective, very capable, just, you know, she was one of those hero people that we really couldn't wait to you know that we, we had a bit of a fan crush on like we couldn't wait to interview her so yeah. we had the opportunity which was really exciting in terms of her leadership learnings from working in this space and on the day that I was due to interview her I got this message to say hey Jolie you just need to know I'm not in the office I'm at I'm at home on stress leave 
we can go ahead and do the interview, but I'm, I'm at home and I'm like, well, this doesn't need to happen today or if ever, right? Like if, you know, your, your health and um, recovery is most important. And she, she was very magnanimous. She said, look, you know, this happen, needs to happen now more than ever. I've realized how important this is. And I interviewed her and she talked about the very real impacts for her of her burnout um, in terms of her health, her relationships, her mental health. Um, and, you know, again, very, very sobering to hear it, you know, this incredible leader. Um, and we've, this is, we've seen this play out in many forms again and again um, with great leaders. And she said, but it's not the scary thing. And we said, well, well, what is scarier than that? And she said, it was the fact that when I was kind of forced off that treadmill, you know, this never ending treadmill and my body eventually said, I can't do this anymore enough. And I, and I had to stop, um, not by choice, but because my body demanded it of me. She said, I stopped and I turned around and I looked at my team and I had this realization that my team was about two or three weeks behind me on that journey to burnout. And so, you know, it's a question we often have leaders ask themselves regularly, where am I at? Because that's where I'm leading others to. And often it's really uncomfortable to prioritize ourselves and we should do it for ourselves. But if, if we can't get there with that reasoning, then at very least thinking about where it is we're leading others to. Because, you know, I talked about that triple responsibility. We can encourage people to, play, to you know, the self-care piece. But if, if we just keep loading them up and some of that loading them up might be the stressors that include the sending emails at two o'clock in the morning, you know, the, the modeling that for our people where it, it makes it uncomfortable for them to do what they need to do to look after themselves. Yes. And it, you know, and there is something about disaster because it, it does feel like everything is in a hurry and you, you, yeah. you know, you touch on it right in the beginning. And so what point is it, are you not in a hurry anymore? And, you know, in my case, I'm just going to make this all about me. I don't mean to, but mm -hmm. um, because I helped so many other communities boots on the ground um, very soon after disaster, then it sort of renews that, um, you know, I love the humanity piece. And so I'm not a martyr, like I'm totally going in there because I really love watching people be extraordinary and in really yes. difficult circumstances. That's my thing in life. And I like to be like, how can I help you do more stuff? But then I may tell them to take care of themselves. But a couple of years ago, I got a call um, four days from now from a Dixie Fire person. Dixie Fire um, actually burned down four years ago tomorrow. Right. And um, I'm sorry, two years ago tomorrow on August 4th. And so I got a call on August 8th from a survivor and he was like, I don't even know. I don't even remember where, oh, he got my name from a mutual friend who used to work for the governor of California, um, Gil. And he was like, we need you here now. And I was like, you know, I'm not really the best. I'm not a firefighter. Your fire, their fire burned for another um, 80 days after that. And he was like, nope, we've got to have, he just went on and on, you know, we've got to have you here now because we need hope. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that was my birthday. And yeah. I was about to get, I it took the phone call and I was about to get on the Russian river, one of my favorite like decompressing things. And I just had a terrible day. I couldn't stop thinking about the grief and the upset. And then I was really trying to disconnect from it you know, but by that evening, I was like, I just want to go home, you know, our hotel, we just let it go. I was like, I just can't, I can't do it. I, I can't, I feel so bad sitting here doing something nice when the, all these people are suffering and I have to, I'm going to go. And I was there um, on, by August 12th. I'm going back tomorrow for the two year, which is great. But, you know, I didn't have any separation. I think I've been much better about that the last two years, mostly because I hurt my back this year and that sort of forced me into, you know, into a totally different place for months, but it was um, unhealthy. And, you know, it's that being needed and knowing that you have the capability, but sometimes you have to, you know, you don't want to lose your empathy or your compassion. You don't want to do any of those things. So finding that mode of separation that's healthy, I mean, what yeah. do you say for that? That's a hard, I mean, my, my body forced the issue period. Like that was yeah. the deal. And but our bodies would, are amazing like that. Right. But yeah, often that, that comes with pain and it comes with, you know, so how do we get there before that happens is, is yeah. always the question, right? Yeah, it and, is always. Yeah. So what, so how do we get there before that happens? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very big at painting the, basically joining the dots for people because 
you know, as, as much as I don't want to scare people, I have seen the impacts play out, you know, in terms of I've lost people working in the space because of what happened to their physical health. You know, I've seen what it has meant for them in terms of their parenting and, and what it meant with their relationships with their kids or their spouses or their mental health. And when you've seen it play out again and again, it's very real. But when you're going into it, it's kind of this abstract risk that that's probably, we have a Western, a very Western um, bias, again, talk about cognitive biases of the optimism bias, that something bad will happen to someone else, yeah. right? And you know, and disaster, when you work in disasters, you know, you know, you know, this bias is not very real, you know, that, it, <laughs> that, it, that it's incorrect. Right. But, but we still operate that way. Like, you know, we think that um, something like 75% of people think they're better than average drivers, right? Which <laughs> that, that doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work in terms of the reality. You know, we all think that we are much less likely to get divorced or to have um, cardiac issues or than what we really are. So, you know, um, I always say to people, if it's very hazardous working in this space, you know, it is incredibly rewarding, it's very fulfilling. If we do it well, it provides the most amazing conditions for learning and growth. We'll come out at the end with these amazing, you know, learnings and um, new skills and different view on life. But the ver very real reality is for many people working in this space, it, you know, it's it's a cause of harm. Mm -hmm. And if you had someone working on, at heights up on scaffolding, psychologically, it doesn't take much mentally for us to equate in our heads what might happen to that person if we don't manage that well, yeah. right? We can kind of imagine the harm, mm -hmm. but it's not as obvious for us working under prolonged pressure um, what that harm might look like. So we're, we're very big on kind of painting that for people, but then saying here are the positive strategies, the things that you can do that are doable under pressure. Because all of those wellbeing strategies, the training that we ran in Christchurch, it just was not set up for the kind of environments we're working in. And it just felt, you know, you're talking to emergency managers about, you know, don't have technology in your bedroom, which doesn't work when you've got two phones and you're on call and, you know. <laughs> so, you know, just very much thinking about those, those strategies that are usable, doable, um, applicable under pressure again and ones that that will work for you mm -hmm. so I, you asked me about the the doing well and kind of the approach behind that um, for us there were some design challenges that went into every theme that you'll see in that pack so for example we all well most of us know not everyone knows but you know most people know and in the world of emergencies we, we talk about social capital mm -hmm. so the people who have and this is over, oversimplifying it you know wait that's um, okay because I love yeah. talking about this go ahead yeah Just but this is really oversimplifying it you know and my apologies I know some amazing researchers in the space but to oversimplify it in a way that will probably have their toes curl but basically people with a close social network that use it and lean into it under pressure are the ones that are going to have better outcomes, right? They're going to do better. And um, so we know that, and we would talk about that in our, you know, working with people in communities, but also with our team. And then the reality would play out. You're under pressure for a really long time. People are exhausted. And so, you know, the energy it takes to catch up with their friends like they used to, to take the calls or make calls to their family, you know, to be able to commit to the sports things they used to do regularly, to be able to hear the things from their friends, people around them who could see they were heading for a bit of a fall, you know, all of that. So we would know we need to lean into our social networks and then our actual behavior was the opposite. Mm -hmm. So the very thing we need most, we would lean away from. And so there's a set of cards that helps people really set up that crew when you're probably not going to be wanting to be connecting or leaning into it, but having people know how to reach out and support you um, through that. There's a set of cards around actually decision making. We often don't have our prefrontal cortex online, right, which is the part of our brain we really want to be able to access and use to make great decisions. And we talked about those thousands of decisions that you're encountering, whether you're working in it or living it after disaster and having to make these decisions that are going to have life shaping impact yeah. for yourself, your family, or for a community, if you're working with a community. And so, um, you know, the risk of making a bum decision, and then the stress of that. So there's a, a set of cards in there around, here's some questions you can test some decisions against, to give you a little bit more contemplation, reflection space, more confidence in your decision making. 
Um, there's some things around tuning back into your body, the physical aspects, because that physical health component is so huge. Mm -hmm. And we often forget how our physical um, body is doing is going to influence how our brain is able to operate in terms of the role. That's that very play. primary. I think too, yeah. because you have to offload the stress. Like it has, yes. it's going to offload somehow and to figure, to figure it out. And also not to have your whole social network be immersed in disaster. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that's so important because otherwise they may not have the perspective. You may get praised for a culture of burnout. Yeah. That's very common in this space. We'd be like, oh, you know, I had, a, I had a boss tell me last year, the year before, she was so proud to text me that one of her employees was working 14 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why are you bragging about that? I think that's yeah. so lame. Like, yeah. that's terrible. Like, why are you, why is there, why are we rewarding each other for that? And so, you know, when I talk about company culture, in this space, one of the first rules should be do not reward burnout yeah. because that's yeah. constantly what happens in this space. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah. So when it comes to that, that social connection, setting up your crew, yeah. it's like you want to have a few different people. You want to have someone who gets it, right? Yeah. A peer who kind of understands it, so that you mm -hmm. can talk about it and, and they get it. And you might want to have someone who maybe has been through it before, like yourself, mm -hmm. Jennifer, right? Has been through it before. They get it but they're not in it. So they haven't lost perspective in the same way that we may all risk doing at a similar point in time, right? Um, yes, or if I, I'm just going to pin that really quickly because I find that one of the most valuable things that I do for leaders who are local, who are, but I'm not part of their disaster. I'm just mm -hmm. coaching from behind leadership through you know followership and like saying, how can we help you locally lead and design your recovery? But I have found many, many like dozens of times once we get on a Zoom call, if I'm sitting there and it's gentle and because I'm not part of their disaster, they just need to cry. Yeah. They yeah. just break into tears and it's the compassion and understanding, but it's like, oh, I don't have to know. You don't mm -hmm. want anything from me. You do, you know, it's just, I can't over, I can't overstate enough. Like that would surprise me, but not now, not now, but in the beginning, but I, now I, as soon as you even verbalize it, like maybe what you need to do is cry and you can yeah. do that with me. And then they all often apologize like, Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'm like, no, 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 this is perfect. This is exactly what yes. I should be here for. Cause it's exactly what you need. We don't have to talk about FEMA and HUD and SB and roads and debris removal at all times. Like, let's talk about you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're wearing this hat where you or this role where you're constantly having to portray yourself as capable, mm -hmm. you know, and you're carrying the weight for others and, you know, trying to be calm for others and doing all this for others. Um, and if you can connect with someone who's been through something similar, I mean, one, they'll say, hey, this is hard. If you're finding it hard, it's because it is hard. Mm -hmm. Like I have, we've worked with thousands of recovery leaders. I've not found one who's found it easy, right? <laughs> it's something that's so nice and knowing that, right? But it's not that yeah. I'm incapable. It's not that I'm, you know, uh, weak or any of those things that we yeah. often beat ourselves up with. Right. And you could feel it in the room in the Marshall fire too, because I've been working with the, with them for 19 months of their 20 month um, post disaster. And you know, you could feel like who was ready for it, who wasn't ready for it, who, but you could feel like whew, there was that like, oh, okay, we're not going to talk about like how to serve the community. We're actually talking about how to serve our, our own well-being. And it was, I, you could, I, I felt like it was, I felt like the energetically, it was very um, needed and welcomed and appreciated. Yeah. And sometimes you'll only get leaders to turn up to something like that if they know it's about setting themselves up to support We'll continue that support role as best as possible because we're so driven that way and we're so you know so often often we don't couch it around actually we're going to provide some strategies and some normalize what you're going through first right as a, a recovery leader because this isn't easy you know and just knowing that is really helpful and then let's connect you with those learnings from other leaders who've been through something similar and let's put some practical things in place to really sustain you and set you up so that you can continue to do your best by your community. Um, they wouldn't often come if you say, look, this is about your mental health and setting you up because, you know, have you seen what, I, what you know, what it is that's going on? And, and you know, so um, often it's about so that you can best serve your community. And we, we feel the weight of that as a recovery leader. And then the relief of knowing you're normal and there's some things I can do to sustain ourselves, but also knowing what's at stake right? Knowing yes. why this is so important. 
And I think that's so, I know that in the beginning of our disaster, we have this really wonderful, uh, I would like to introduce you, I don't think I have yet, to Dr. Adrienne Hines. She works at Stanford Center for PTSD, and she lives here in Sonoma County. And so she designed this wildfire mental health collaborative so that every person through a federal grant um, who had access to something, um, yes. either one-on-one -on -one or group or yoga. It was all trauma-informed. She's uh, you, you guys would get along beautifully, crazy beautifully. Um, but I remember I was looking around and, for, and there was like this, there was like this gradation where people who didn't die, be like, well, I didn't die. Mm -hmm. And then there were people who lost their homes and they were the next on the list. And they'd be like, they'd say, oh, well, I didn't die, but I did lose my home, but I'm okay. And then there were people like me who didn't lose their home, but went through the entire disaster. And I'd be like, well, I didn't die and I didn't lose my home. So why would I ask for that um, mental health? Like I can't take advantage of any resource that's helping somebody who definitely needs it more. I'm not the family of a deceased person. I, you know, I, and so we, they didn't take it. I know I would have never considered taking it until it was like a year later to, I didn't even realize how stressed out I was for like three years. Like it took a long time. Um, but I really, if you're listening to this and you're fresh or new or curious, if that resource is there, you, it's also there for you. If you've experienced a disaster, disaster survivor, yes, there's different degrees for sure of trauma, but if you are in this space, you are actually part of the solution, mm -hmm. but you're also part of the need base. Don't yeah. mistake, don't, don't, don't think that's not true. We call that the hierarchy of grief. And we see that play out again and again after disaster in a way that's often unhelpful, mm -hmm. right? So um, people who are often united at the beginning, really supportive of each other, their different experiences will, will play out differently as you become tired, find it really hard to see beyond your own experience. And so there becomes a, an othering of people on a different part of that, that ladder, you know, that grief yeah. ladder. Yeah. And a discounting of for ourselves or each other of the very real impacts and needs that people have, no matter how they're impacted, right? So yeah. um, just being aware of that, that everybody, you know, you can have a very similar experience on the day and very different impacts and very different support needs yes. um, and a very different experience. Mm -hmm. You can have very different experiences, but because of what it is you bring to an event, you, you know, the impacts will, will play out differently. Um, but that that need to downplay I think, I think one of the beautiful things disasters have to teach us is how to not just offer support, but receive it. Yeah. You know, like we're not very good at that as humans. Yeah. And, and when you were talking about that, it brought to mind a story or a person, a person that we encountered in the, in the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, he was um, an old retired military veteran, tough as boots kind of guy, right? and didn't have a lot of family support he was living in a um a council housing so local government supplied housing um and in a small unit and we knocked on his door basically letting people know about these grants that were available for initial you know immediate assistance and um he said no no i'm fine i'm good there are people much worse off than us and, and i don't know how we got on to further conversation he said and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm, well, I've kind of moved into the, into my living area where my te television is because, you know, at this point he had power, um, electricity. And, and he said, it, it just gives him some company. And it was through this conversation, we realized that his ceiling had caved in in his bedroom. Oh gosh. And he had moved his life into the living room, but he was fine. Right. And so again, amazingly resilient amazing coping skills but being able to say these grants he's like those grants aren't for me they're for someone else who needs it right but being able to say actually these grants are for those sorts of things that we can address some immediate need and we can get you back into your bedroom and, and all of those things but we do have this we're very good at donating and giving to causes mm -hmm. but not very good at being at the other end and there's something yeah. beautiful in, in the human spirit around you know how do we learn to receive but also that means that we are better givers because we understand how to maintain dignity and the um, resilience respect the resilience and the power that someone has even when they're impacted by something like a disaster you know if we can understand that and be better more gracious at that as humans that would be a good thing
It would be, it would be good. And you, just when you were talking, that also reminded me that um, one of the women who was one of the leaders that you met last week in the Marshall fire, when we first met, she said, because she, I, I just met her for the first time because she lost her home and then she had to leave for six months. Right. She had to go. And then when she was talking to me this time, she was apologetic for the fact that she didn't stay to suffer. And yeah. I was like, um, yeah, that's okay because you actually need people who have like this sort of, um, for, you know, the fortitude who are a little more fresh into it um, to kind of like take up the second, third, fourth, fifth waves because it does last so long. But yeah. the but imagine apologizing for not apologizing for not suffering more um, in the beginning and feeling guilty about that. And I there's I, a lot of guilt around choices. Yeah, right? there's a lot of guilt around. What is right for me and my family may not be right for you and yours. So, you know, after the Christchurch earthquakes, there was a lot of assessment done on the ground. It would liquefy with an earthquake. And so that would really impact the structural integrity of buildings and houses. And so some calls had to be made as to whether or not that people should be able to rebuild on their land. Oh, yeah. And so um, then there became this whole, you know, people again who've been united in a neighborhood became divided because there were some that, you know, took the payout and moved on and others who wanted to fight to stay. Mm -hmm. And that's this whole, you know, what is right for one person is so different to what might be right for somebody else. And just understanding that. And there's some great research from the University of Melbourne and um, Victoria, Australia, around people after the Black Saturday bushfires, as, as they call it, bushfires around the wildfires, um, looking at following the mental health and well-being and recovery process of those who left the community and didn't come back and those that stayed. And actually, they, they had a very similar kind of, you know, um, I guess, how they did or how they were doing, you know, or how they were recovering was similar. They both were dealing with stressors and impacts. They were just different. Those that left weren't faced with the immediate constant reminder and the triggers of being in the event, but they weren't surrounded by people who understood and they felt the guilt of having left. And those that stayed, you know, were surrounded by people who understood, but they also had the triggers and the rebuild process. And so one wasn't better or easier than the other. It was just, you have to make the decision that is right for you and respect, hopefully, the decisions that others make, you know. And I think, you know, I remember in the very beginning of our disaster, because when I, when I took this job, there was, it was, um, you know, it was high, there was a lot of high profile people on our board. And so for the first year, anyway, we got a lot of press coverage and then really none locally for about four years for another reason. That's okay. It has nothing to do with me. Um, and I was asked often by the press because we had this love, the love in the air was actually born here in Sonoma and, you know, that's where everybody saw it and, um, and the person who wrote that, the love in the air is thicker than the smoke, um, did not take credit for it. And, and they said it should be shared. I actually happened to know who it was, but um, because there was so much love in the air and shared a purpose and this unprecedented disaster, which is very similar to Christchurch, because that was just a, mag it was just the magnitude of that disaster was so um, overwhelming. And ours was so overwhelming. And within that first year, though, when people were making the decision to, to move away and not do it, some people did make that decision. Mm -hmm. And other people, they were clinging to each other. And actually, there was, re there was, there were new, new, huge level of social capital building here. Yes. But I would get that call for, I would get that ask from reporters, and they'd be like, well, what do you think about the people who aren't doing it? And I'd be like, it's, it turns out, not my decision. Yeah. I don't judge them. Like they should do what it's like, it is, it's a shared experience. It's deeply personal at the same time. So who am I to say that they should go through a suffering that they are not, that they don't want to do like, it's okay. But you're, but I really am glad that you pointed out there is an isolation to people mm -hmm. not understanding. Mm -hmm. I saw that with a Dixie fire survivor who came here about a month after um, Greenville burned down and he was walking around and, and he said to me, you know, I kept telling people I'm a fire survivor and nobody seems to care here. And I'm like, I don't know how to tell you this, but we're all fire survivors here. And we've actually had the, our, you know, 2017 North Bay and three mega fires since then. So, um, so he felt more isolated by it, but also this other weird thing is that he went into a very disaster affected community and then felt like it might, the people might give him more of what he needed, but they were not able to do that. So it's complex. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and there's something I remember having just a moment where and it was I think on my first lot of interviews for the Winston Churchill Fellowship so I started in Melbourne and then worked my way it was Japan the States Europe but my first stop was in Melbourne and then into the areas that had been impacted by the Black Saturday wildfires and I remember I'd come from a city where the central business district was roped off your workplace was damaged you know like dust rubble mess the roads looked like that your home looked like that there was, was just, just no me. escaping it as you know if you in a community had been through a fire you'd understand you know everyone understands understands it but it's hard to explain that often to people outside and then getting to Melbourne and just sitting on a bench and watching I could hear these church bells going I could see people you know like doing their daily thing going to cafes getting coffee taking buses doing all the things the normal hustle and bustle of a city and just the surreal feeling of I don't know it was it was nice to escape the disaster zone but at the same stage it was also very I don't know isolating to sit there and go no one here would get it right no one here would get it so yeah and I think you talked to before about being able to imagine it and understand it there's a we talked about you know, how do we support agencies to support communities and one of the aha moments I had was I went to a flood conference um, in the in Ireland and oddly enough it was at the um the Titanic Museum, which is <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> but um, it was a uh, had you know uh, local government officials, a lot of people who worked in emergencies, various different government officials, all sorts of agencies that support after disaster, and they did this wonderful job of saying, "Look, we always focus on preparedness and in initial relief response phases. We are not as um, proficient as thinking about planning or talking about the long term recovery." So they set this particular conference up to be thinking about the recovery aspect. Um, and so they had, they did a great job of framing it. They had a survivor from a community um, in Norway explain, you know, some of the, what they went through as a community. And then we broke out into different groups to um, address and look at various different components of recovery or different challenges. And what really struck me is you had a group of people who hadn't lived it, or worked in it were really keen to support mm -hmm. but the conversations could not progress beyond sandbags and the initial cleanup and it's because as a cognitive scientist you've got to have like we can only add knowledge onto something that exists you know in, in our yes. brain in terms of what we've experienced or seen or and so there was this big gap between if I can't imagine it how do I plan for it? How do I support people through it? How do I, you know, what is happening to a community at one year? What is going on at, you know, what are the challenges that they face and, you know, the opportunities that we need to think about? Um, and it's one of the reasons we, we work with agencies, because if we can give them some basis around some lived experience, understanding of recovery and what might a community be going through, they can start thinking about how to design their systems, processes, supports, or the way they, they interact in a way that makes more sense. But we're asking a lot of people if they've never experienced it and can't imagine it to do you, that. No? We we are. We still are. I know we're going long, but I don't care. So if, <laughs> if you're like, gosh, this podcast is long. Yes, it is. I know. Um, I'd like to say that one of my great um, frustrations or challenges in the work that I do is that I so believe in the boots on the ground on the front lines mm -hmm. of people who are in it at all stages because yes. I and I've never walked in and not learned something I've never you know walked in and be like oh I know everything going on here and I'm not going you know it's never ever ever happened because if you listen to the people on the ground experiencing that particular disaster no matter how many mega fires I've been in it's always the same thing I walk in I listen, I figure out, I learn something new because I'm trying to design how we are going to help them in a way that's culturally relevant, that's, you know, helpful, that's curious <laughs> instead yes. of arrogant. And, um, and because I think it's the best research and development on the planet. And then yes. I like to filter that all the way up to the very tippy top of government through legislation and helping agencies understand. But I am never, ever... I'm thrilled by the fact that I've been to so many disaster conferences that have not one 
or maybe they have one disaster survivor, maybe. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they talk around disaster and yeah. survivors and over them. Or the conversation yeah. is they don't really know what they want. They don't really know what they need. And I just don't find that to be true at all. Yeah. You know, and it may be like, so what if they're not um, disaster experts at the beginning? Like, I didn't know anything about wildfire nothing. I knew nothing. I'd been through earthquakes, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know it. I never even thought about it. Um, and now I know a lot. I can have a PhD in wildfire community recovery. Um, but, you know, you've got to actually stop gatekeeping for people yes. who've been through disasters. They're not dumb because they went through a disaster. That's they're not. It's one of those things that makes me insane. So at the summit that you're coming to, which I'm so excited, um, you know, I prioritize having frontline communities there all the way up to policymakers and innovators and private sector and national NGOs. And like, listen, because they're going to tell you everything you need to know about how to actually serve better. And that's my soapbox. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, people are not blank slates. They come with all sorts of experience. They know and understand their communities. They are the ones that will drive recovery. Yeah. And, you know, I've often worked because I come from the emergency management space. We had a lot of people when there's in the training or exercises, it's that group over there that are affected. I'm like, you might also be that group, yeah. right? There's not this false division of this other group that are victims. I will never use that, you know, word for that, for that reason. Um, and yeah, often you might be impacted and, and you'll have more empathy, you know, in terms of, but, you know, helping people understand and bridge that, I think, is a really important role because, again, we talked about that secondary stress where you have agencies who are genuinely trying to help. But without, a you know, that, that understanding that they may need, there becomes this divide between them and the people on the ground. And that becomes a huge source of support, uh, sorry, source of stress and yes. a handbrake to recovery. Yeah. So how do we help actually, you know, people often talk about community-led recovery, which I'm a big fan of, but often it's a partnership approach. Has we need those agencies. We need that extra support yeah. from outside. So how do we set up in a way that is constructive, that builds that bridge, that builds the empathy and understanding, and that there's, you know, some mutual learning in both directions? And I think the most important, you know, what we learned, what I learned for sure during our fires is that I did really well if I just asked, um, what do you need and how can I help? And it, and the answer yesterday could be different from the answer today. And yeah. then we had a group of us who were willing to take the information that we'd learned or if we were doing something wrong, you know, we weren't like wedded to our processes. It was like, oh, okay, here's what's here. So we could meet every day and talk about like, how are we going to deliver food? Uh, make sure shelters are supported. Like, how are we going to make sure everyone has a mask? Because that's something in a mega fire that's um, particularly important. Um, but to be not afraid of saying, I don't know, mm -hmm. and to not be afraid of saying, what do you need and how can we help? And then to sort of fill it in from there. And I think that, um, you know, one of the, I think, I think people get into philanthropy and disaster because they do care for yeah. sure. They're, it's not yeah. poorly intended, but no. there tends to be a fear of actually asking an open-ended question and not being able to deliver because then you are subject to criticism, especially if you are a government entity. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that from behind the scenes in Sonoma, in the County of Sonoma because that's where I worked at the time, that there were some leaders who were fine with, I don't know, who are like, I don't know, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to risk criticism. And there were others who were like, I can't, I, I do not want, I can't take that wall of anger and grief and trauma. And so I'm just going to shut down or shut them down or just hide behind it, you know, whatever it is. And there was just this whole spectrum of leadership responses and um, I would encourage people to find, I, I always tell new communities that your superpower is the words, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. then you can ask or you can tell, and that has to be on both sides. Absolutely. It can't be that one side is like all knowing and super expert and the other side is like cast is like not knowing. And so we just figure out like, what am I willing to do for you? Like there are only certain things I can do, but maybe I can find them the person who needs what it is that they need. And if I can't do it, I'm just honest about it. And then I'm not re-traumatizing them. Absolutely. And everything is turned upside down after disaster. So there is the opportunity to work differently, to collaborate differently, to not know, but to figure it out together, you yeah. know? So yes. it's, it's the space of any space to be able to say, 
I don't know. Let's figure it out. You know, totally. I do. I will say though, that I do have sometimes like I, I, I tend to be a grudge holder. I'll just say that on a podcast. It's fine. Whatever. So I, there are certain people who were like, oh, I'm going to take care of us all by myself. Mm-hmm. And I don't want you to be there because I want all, I want sunshine all over me. I actually had a leader tell everybody in a room full of really powerful people that he was in charge of the four counties that I was actually in charge of, but he was in charge of downtown Santa Rosa in real life. But I was like, that is so strange because I don't know how any of us are going to get through this without each Mm -hmm. other. I know I'm not capable of doing it alone. So I don't know why you're being such a weirdo, but you know, you, you do see that in disaster. People are like, oh no, I got this. I had another guy at another community tell me that he had Googled me. And he already knew everything that I knew, have, even though he'd never been through a wildfire or a disaster. I was like, oh, cool, dude, you let me know how that works out and I'll be right here and that's fine. And he hadn't even been through the disaster. It was his hometown. Anyway, those are my petty disasters, side names. Yeah, disasters are political and yeah. you know, there's egos involved and um, people when they're under immense pressure too will show up differently in terms of when they're feeling wobbly Mm -hmm. Um, and the leaders that tend to do best we've seen leaders fall over right we've seen it play out make poor decisions um, that have impacted their careers and their communities we've seen it play out in many different ways the leaders I worry about are the ones that have to project that they've got it all together they know all the answers and I don't need any help they're the ones that are most likely to end up in a pile right um and and not a good space in the long run so um if you're a leader in any way shape or form after disaster you know the more that you can be curious open ask questions surround yourself with truth tellers with people who can i don't know but i'll find out for you who can do the legs on the research who can you know those those people that you can be open with and vulnerable with and it may not be people in your community it might be people who've been through it before like yourself jennifer right but people who are open to that yeah Mm -hmm. people who are open to that will do better for sure. So uh, we so let's let's go like another two to three minutes. One of the things I always like to ask is: Is there something that I haven't asked you today that you wish I had, or you would like included in this podcast? I think so. I think we've covered a massive amount of ground. I could I could go on. I really could. Like yeah. I, there's probably about three or four things I said I could say, but actually, I really love the ground that we've covered. It's been great. I do too. Yeah, I could go on forever too. And actually at the end of our deployment last week, I was like, oh, I'm just going to look for, I mean, I'm just going to start to like manufacture reasons, whatever it is. Like it was so, um, one of the things, and I'm, I think you could probably relate to this, that, you know, you're always searching for the helpers in this job. And be, especially when you know that there's just no way that you can serve without a cadre of super cool, you know, competent people who are compassionate and caring. And there's, that's a lot of alliteration for one sentence, but, um, um, it, for me, it was like, I, I, ha- I mean, I have a few people that I think are great in this space, but like with the tools and with your capabilities of moving through these disasters, I was like, how do I make sure that I add in Jolie and make sure she gets funded and all of those sorts of things? Because it felt like such a relief to have you yeah. along. Yeah. And these are, these are all the things that we wished we'd had in our event that we see others wish that they had had. Yeah. So I guess that would be the only thing is, is there somewhere that we can send people for, you know, there's that leadership companion that is a free download. There's 12 principles for supporting people in this space that like we've got some things that you can put in your pocket to help through what is a really tough role. So, yeah. And we will put um, all the links and you've already sent some links. And if there's some extras that you've thought about in the course of this conversation, do send right. those. I'm um, super, very, I mean, we always put it in there. We always do full transcripts. We like to meet people exactly where they're at, which is why it's both, auto, you know, we're trying as hard as we can. And so um, I look forward to the next to seeing you um, in September, but also I'm not looking forward to the next disaster, but I am looking forward to the next opportunity to actually see, see, see you at work because I think you're pretty cool. Yeah, likewise, Jennifer. Mm-hmm. It's good. All right. Thank you so much. Once again, this has been the How to Disaster podcast and thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, How to Disaster. For more information, please visit our website at afterthefireusa.org. And if you liked this video, please hit subscribe.